Kot veste, začenjamo vsak nov ciklus o priložnosti začetka akademskega leta, kot ga bomo praznovali jutri. In po tradiciji so tudi predavatelji na prvem znanstvenem večeru dobitniki prestižnih priznanj Univerze v Novi Gorici, kar pomeni seveda, da so to vrhunski znanstveniki, ki so prispevali pomembne dosežke v zakladnico našega znanja. Tako je tudi danes. Naš gost je profesor dr. Igor Gregorič, ki je eden najuspešnih srčnih kirurgov, ki izvajajo presaditve srca. Njegova biografija, vključno z navedbo vseh bibliografskih enot, šteje točno 69 strani, kot mi je bila predložena. Zato najbrž verjamete, da bi trajalo predolgo, da vse to predstavimo, tako da bom profesor Gregorič samo izpostavil nekaj najpomembnejših biografskih podatkov in dosežkov profesor Gregoriča, ki je diplomiral leta 1979 na Medicinski fakulteti Univerze v Ljubljani in leta 1982 pričel specializacijo iz splošne kirurgije v splošni bolnici Nova Gorica in v Univerzitetnem kliničnem centru v Ljubljani. Strokovno sposabljanje je nadaljeval na Texas Heart Institute v Houstonu, v ZDA. Tam je leta 1996 končal specializacijo iz splošne kirurgije, leta 1998 pa še specializacijo iz kardiovaskularne in torakalne kirurgije. Iz tega leta se je zaposlil v bolnišnici St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital v Houstonu, ter leta 2001 postal pomočnik vodje transplantacijskega oddelka. Med letoma 2008 in 2012 je bil profesor Gregorič direktor raziskovalnega centra za mehansko podporo cirkulacije krvi. Od leta 2012 pa je vodja in programski direktor kiruškega oddelka centra za napredovalo srčno popuščanje in program transplantacije v bolnišnici Memorial Herman Hospital v Houstonu. Hkrat je tudi direktor raziskovalnega centra in profesor kardiotorakalne in vaskuralne kirurgije na medicinski fakulteti in Andersonovem centru za rak na Univerzi Texas. Profesor Igor Gregorič je bil pobudnik razvoja mehanske podpore pri bovnikih srčnim popuščanjem. S kolegi je razbil različne tipe in sisteme mehanskih srčnih črpalk, ki jih danes rutinsko uporabljajo v vrhunskih zdravstvenih ustanovah po vsem svetu. Sodeloval je tudi pri razvoju novih postopkov pri posegih na koronarih arterijah. Proočeval je varnost bioloških protest ter zaplete, ki so posledica vstavitve umetnih materijalov, zlasti, tromboemboličnih komplikacij. Poleg tega je vodil številne raziskovalne projekte, kjer so proočevali učinkovitost različnih metod transplantacije srca. Za svoje raziskovalno delo in strokovno delo je prejel številna priznanja, med katerimi bom izpostavil samo nekaj, na primer Hipokratovo priznanje Zdravniške zbornice Slovenije, priznanje Best Doctors of America v letih 2011 in 2010 in priznanje Medical Honorary 2014, ki ga podeljuje Ameriško združenje za srce. Toliko na kratko, zdaj pa predlagam, da prepustimo besedo profesor Irgoliču, da nam pove kaj več o mehanski srčni podpori in transplantaciji srca pri napredovanem srčnem popuščanju. Profesor Irgolič, prosim. Najlepša hvala, dobro večer. Jaz sem hotel, da se govori v slovenščini, ampak mislim, da je tu veliko gostov iz Slovenske, tuji gostov in so me prosili, če bi lahko v angliščini, tako bom zdaj kar prešaltil na angliško. So, very much a great welcome. Thank you very much for coming. It's my extreme pleasure to be here and extreme honor to be invited to give this lecture. Specifically because I was born in Copper, but I moved as a one-year-old kid to Prvačina, pri Novi Gorici, which is about 10, 15 kilometers from here. And so uh, I come from this area and uh, somehow my career ended up in the United States uh, and I've been there since 1984. So 
I lived there longer than I lived in Slovenia, but uh, I usually say I work in the United States, but I uh, am from Slovenia, and so my heart is still over here. Anyway, my career as... Uh, uh, first, I would like to thank also for the invitation for the, uh, from the um, university and uh, for the opportunity to give this talk. The uh, road to where I am today was not easy, and you know that is uh, United States, you have to show your hard work, and eventually it's a land of opportunity and the dreams come true. So I can say that for me, uh, the luck has uh, really shined on, on my road, and uh, I was lucky to end where I am today. I hope uh, this is not the end of the road, but at the beginning of the road, and so we'll we'll hope for uh, uh, some more successes, if we can call them that in the future. My talk today is about the heart transplantation and also mechanical circulatory support. What is mechanical circulatory support? It means that you help the failing heart with a circulatory support, which we call usually a pump. A pump that pumps the heart or helps to pump the heart. The heart is the pump itself, but it's you know, constructed from the muscle and the cells but we work with the mechanical pumps, which is made mainly, they are made from titanium. So in um, the cardiovascular disease, it's uh, very much a, the killer of the uh, populations nowadays. You see that in the United States, it's about 850,000 people that die every year from cardiovascular disease, more than the uh, cancer, which is about uh, two thirds, uh, so one third less than cardiovascular disease. And also the patients are very much uh, bound to come into the hospital because of cardiovascular disease. is the number one uh, uh, cause for the admission to the hospital. Uh, just the prevalence, so cardiovascular disease is a lot of uh, etiology, a lot of uh, reasons why people come to the hospital, but I deal specifically at the end stage. So at the end of the road, so to speak, you know, uh, majority of the diseases today can be treated with the medication. My focus is when that fails, what can you do to make the people survive and have good quality of life? So the prevalence in US is about 4.5 million people that are uh, suffering from heart failure and 550,000 new cases every year. Uh, there is also about almost 300 deaths per year from this entity. And the etiology, so the causes of the disease for the heart failure are very different. Uh, but all can end with the end-stage heart failure, which means end of the road. So the patients, if you do not do something, when they reach that stage and they are on some medication, they have 9 out of 10 chance of dying without, with one year. So only 10% uh, survive, 1 out of 10. Basically, they die. This is a patient with heart failure. I wanted to show you what that disease really means. A patient is on home oxygen. The clock is ticking. That was uh, obviously uh, meant, and he's describing his difficulty of everyday living. He cannot really walk very far. He has really hard time even to eat by himself, and definitely he has to pause when he's going down upstairs to his bedroom. You see here, he's trying to eat, and he's having difficulty to do that. That is the patient in end-stage heart failure, stage D, and New York Class Association 4, which is really the worst of the worst. Here is how he's trying to walk upstairs, and if you don't do anything to this patient, if they get or are on some medication, they will probably die within one year. So how can we help this population of patients? This is the end stage, that's why I'm saying most of this is treatment with medication. At the end stage is either you put them on a transplant list, or you give them mechanical support, or you send them to the hospice. Hospice is comfort care for them to die. So, some things about heart transplantation. As um, mentioned, I came to Memorial Hermann five years ago to build a heart transplant and mechanical support center because in Houston, 
there is a huge Texas Medical Center that employs about 150,000 people a day, which means there is very competitive medicine, and there were already two big institutions over there. They had been dealing with heart transplantation since 1980, so from the very beginning. Matter of fact, at Texas Heart Institute, there was the first successful heart transplantation done in the United States. Not the first one in the world, and we'll talk about that, but the first in the United States that was successful, meaning the patient survived a few days and then uh, died from infection. The heart transplant was uh, started, very first one, I still remember this, it was December 3rd, 1967. This was uh, Christian Barnard, I met him, at uh, one of the events, very nice gentleman from South Africa. He was trained in the United States, in Minnesota, and went to uh, South Africa, to Cape Town, where he did the first transplantation. Why was that possible there and not in the U.S.? The laws about the brain death versus the death were different in the United States than in South Africa. They were a little looser in South Africa. That's why he was able to get the donor in 1968. Soon after that, the laws in America changed for being cardiac death, which means the heart has to stop before you can take it for transplantation, to brain death, where if the patient is brain death, provided you know, that you have the diagnostics that the neurologist or neurosurgeons uh, consider the patient to be death, then you can take the organs. Every patient can save about eight or every donor, I should say, can save about eight lives. So, Christian Barnard, this was the newspaper in, in uh, Cape Town in uh, December 3rd of 1967. However, the problem was the uh, anti-rejection medication, so immunosuppression. In uh, about three and a half years, as you see, there was about 170 transplantations. Look at the survival, only 24 patients survived. Longer term, and when I'm talking about longer term, at that time was like from a few days to six months, which is really a very short, but this was the pioneering work. However, because of this, because of poor results, the transplantation was discouraged at that era. The only one center that continued, and with the Federal Drug Administration approval, which is the government regulatory body in the United States is the Federal Drug Administration, which is called FDA, shortly, they agreed for Stanford and Dr. Shumway, who was really the pioneer in transplantation, although Christian Barner did the transplant, but he was trained with Shumway, and Dr. Shumway, which I, I met him many times, he was extremely hardworking and did all the research, developed the technique and the immunosuppression for his era. He started to do the research in the 50s. That's why Barnard went to Minnesota, actually, because Dr. Shumway was a little older, and Barnard came over there to train. Somehow, he did the first transplant, and now Dr. Shumway. Anyway, the discovery of cyclosporin, which is the immunosuppressive drug, in 76, and it came to America in the 80s. As you know, some drugs are made or, or they are used earlier in, Uni in Europe or elsewhere than the United States because of the FDA. But nevertheless, the 1980s came to the United States, and in 1981, uh, the heart transplantation became, all, uh, again, uh, interesting for the f uh, surgeons to start. And at Texas Heart Institute, I came there in 1984, but they started transplantation in 1982. By the time I came there in, 20, uh, in two years, they had done 20 transplants. So what and how do we do uh, get the uh, matching, the donor? Uh, there is very m few donors, really, considering that there is about 55,000 patients that could benefit from heart transplantation in the United States, and we do only about 2,700 to 3,000 transplants per year. So you can imagine that there is a donor lack or lack of donors, which you cannot really wish for a donor because, you know, somebody has to die to give the heart to another person. But if they do die, uh, we, we could potentially, but we are very careful what we take and which patients, uh, donors who are taking. But we could potentially take a little bit more, but we could never populate all the, or transplant all the patients that are in need for that. So we look at the blood group to match and, and immunologic analysis to match. 
and we cross match with the donor and the recipient if the cross match is negative if the blood group matches and the weight and the height match pretty much will take that heart uh, results are actually pretty good even with that simple matching for the donor to the to the recipient technique is not that complicated because there are big holes that you have to sew together and uh, first we start on the left atrium just for illustration then we go to the right atrium which is the collecting chambers then we go to the uh, pulmonary artery which is the artery that brings the blood to the lungs and then the final anastomosis is the aorta so it's really four big anastomosis and nowadays we modify this technique a little bit but principally is that way what are the results what happens so you see here the numbers in heart transplantation that we have uh, that reached the plateau and i can uh, look at this in favor actually because just in a couple of last years the trend has started to grow again why we are more likely to take a higher risk donors because we learned a little bit more over the last decade or two so that is the uh, reason but if you see over here there was a plateau for a very long time there was enthusiasm in 80s and uh, late 80s and then now we actually surpassed in the e overall this is worldwide this is not just united states and it combines pediatric and the adult but we surpassed 5000 which is the largest number ever most of the centers do between 20 and 40 transplants a year uh, we are fortunate because we uh, we are right here uh, we've done uh, last year about uh, 45 and the year before 50 per year which is a high volume center uh, but 20 to 40 is uh, considered 10 to, to 40 is considered a good center uh, Ljubljana so in Slovenia there is a very good transplant center in Ljubljana and actually I have to say they have the largest per capita transplant number in the world bigger than United States the second is United States they have 15 transplants per million people we in US have about 10 transplants per million people so uh, the donor age is interesting here because in US we are parked here at about 25 years mean age of the donors there is a reason for that uh, we are very careful to take high-risk donors because the FDA and the governing bodies are looking very carefully which center uh, has a good results and which center doesn't and if you fall under the average in in America they may shut down your program there's about 110 heart transplant programs in the United States so we're very careful because we have to be careful not because we want to be careful of course we want to be but we have to be also very careful uh, and provide the best for the patients that doesn't mean that the Europeans are not careful they are very careful also and the results are very simple so we really don't know why in Europe there is a possibility to use older donors and you see here there is a 45 mean age that's almost 20 years in average the older donor in uh, Europe than in United States but nevertheless that's what it is and and it's kind of interesting you know the immunosuppression is pretty standard so I wouldn't spend too much time over here and it goes with cyclosporin, Imuran or uh, MMF uh, uh, and then the uh, steroids. So how do we know that the heart doesn't work? Well because the patients become symptomatic and then we do the routine uh, uh, biopsies over the first month every week strictly uh, and then every, every two weeks after the first month to six months and then once a year after the first year. And so the biopsy will tell you if there is rejection or not. This is just an example of the very severe rejection. And you see over here, these blue dots, those are cells. Those are the attacking cells, the lymphocytes. They attack the muscle, and there should be none, zero. You know, the, and so some patients will reject, but uh, you have to adjust the rejection. Every single heart will reject to some level. But some will, you can control rejection, majority of them, some you cannot, and then you have to ramp up the immunosuppression with additional drugs. Survival is pretty good, actually. You see over here that we learned over the years, you know, from 1982 to 91 was worse than nowadays. Nowadays we are better, but in average, the average heart uh, uh, survival, just of the organ survival, would be about uh, 13 years. Average patient survival will be about uh, 11 and a half years. 
and the uh, five-year survival is about uh, 65, 60 percent, and the 10-year survival is about uh, 50 percent. So, so not too bad because this is the only chance you have really, except mechanical circuitry support. Mechanical circuitry support was developed because we don't have enough donors. That is the reason why we developed the mechanical circuitry support to help these people survive longer. The reasons uh, why uh, survival can be affected is, uh, is recipient's age, is ischemic time. What is ischemic time? The ischemic time means when you take the heart out, you carry it and you put it back in. How long can that be? Four hours is okay. Longer than that, the mortality goes up. The recipient weight, age difference, transplant center volume, it is very important how many transplants you can do per year because if you do only few, the results are not the same as if you do routine. So transplant volume is, is very good. And this is a small little heart that we transplanted at the 1st of November 1984 in the youngest transplant recipient at that time. Her name, I mean, her age was about uh, six months at that time and was the youngest in the world and was done at Texas Heart Institute. And here she is right there. And uh, she lived for a long time thereafter. We didn't know if the heart is going to grow or not. We have no idea. We just had to transplant because the little baby was dying. Thankfully, the heart grew just like a normal child. This is the very first 100 transplants uh, in Texas Heart Institute in 1987. Dr. Cooley over here, the founder of Texas Heart Institute, the greatest and, and the most prolific surgeon in the world in heart uh, surgery. And there is Dr. Frazier over here who was really my mentor and taught me everything I know today. So, this is about transplantation. So I just said earlier, we had to develop something to help these patients because there's about 55,000 and we can help only 5,000 of them. What about the other 50,000? So we had to develop, not me, but the uh, surgeons and the researchers had to develop some mechanical support. And Dr. DeBakey, who was a uh, first big, really uh, important surgeon that came to Texas uh, Medical Center, in 1940s was very prolific in getting the funds from the government for research, not only for transplantation, but also for total artificial heart and also for the mechanical support. He was the one who implanted the very first, uh, the very first um, uh, left ventricular assist device uh, into the left collecting chamber atrium and down into the aorta. This patient lived for a couple of days, but died from infection, but the second uh, in 1966, this was one year before that total artificial heart uh, the transplantation that I was telling you, this patient received the uh, left ventricular assist device and um, was a 37-year-old that had a routine heart surgery at that time and failed, and then they put this pump in, and she lived uh, 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 for another 15 years and unfortunately was hit by a car and died in an accident but she lived normal life afterwards. So that was the very first uh, mechanical circulatory support. The, as the transplant era waned, so did the mechanical support interest because there were really bridges to transplantation. But in 80s, as the transplantation became more popular again, also the left ventricular assist devices or so mechanical support interest became greater. And so I was fortunate to be part of the development of the HeartMate 1, which was the very first pump which was inserted on a Christmas day in Texas Heart, at Texas Heart Institute in uh, Houston in 1986. And that was the beginning of the uh, era of the devices as we know it today. So the first generation were really pulsatile. What does that mean? That means that something is pushing the plate and uh, uh, the plate falls back into the place, either air or electricity. At the beginning, it was air pushing this plate, and these are the very first, very cumbersome devices. These patients could not go home, and the devices had to be outside of the body. So the patients, once they got this, you saved their life, but they couldn't go home, they couldn't do anything. They had to be in the hospital. And when I came over there, I saw a few patients that were there for like a few months already before they got transplantation. Very impractical, but this was the beginning. It's like when Brothers Wright had that little very first plane in 1903. But HeartMate 1 became a popular device and became really, so to speak, a working horse because this was the very first pump that we were able to put in the body, although it's very big, 
but we were able to put in the abdomen or pre before in front of the abdominal wall, but inside the body, so under the skin. And um, was very first pump that the patients could actually leave the hospital. This is the, the f configuration, how it was in the body. We put the pump in the apex at the tip of the heart, and then the pump pumps the blood and goes into the big vessel, which is called aorta, and it's connected to the outside thr through the skin to get to the driving console. Driving console is either air-driven or the elect electrically driven. First was air, and few a few years later became electrically driven. This is the one that was inside of the pump. You see how it looks like. This is the membrane that is pushing the blood. And this is uh, air driven. So through here, there was air. There was pump behind this plate that it was pushing it. And here is the very uh, sort of uh, rude technology, really, how this plate was working in the electrical device. So this was in 1980s. And Mike Templeton, this is our patient, that was the very first patient in the United States that left the hospital. He was very influential and argued with the FDA, I feel great, why don't you have let me go home? Because people had to be in the hospital until the transplantation in that era. He was very influential to change that with the Federal Drug Administration, and he is the reason why today patients can really go home. A great person, this is a uh, patient, a businessman that was working with a HeartMate 2, uh, HeartMate 1, I'm sorry, and uh, so patients had a, a reasonably good uh, quality of life after they were uh, placed in. I showed you the patient what is in the heart failure New York Class Association 4. Once they get the device, they get to New York Class Association 1, which means they can do pretty much everything except swim because they have this drive line. You cannot go to water. So, and uh, the trial that we started in, 1980, uh, in the 1990s and was finished in 2000, actually, was the very first trial and the only trial today that showed comparison of medical management and the device, that the device, so ventricular assist device, improves survival by two, so doubles the survival. The survivals were very poor, as I showed you prior, and uh, medical management in this group of patients had a one-year survival 25%, which is really poor survival. Nevertheless, the pump has a double of that survival. And that made the FDA to approve this device for a standard use in the patients. They are at end stage heart failure and they exhausted all the other therapy. So that was the, and we were part of that trial, obviously. And then the evolution is like every technology. Over time, the new technology comes that is better and it improves the, uh, the results. And so in, in 2000s, we started to use the uh, axial flow. What is that? The other devices, the pulsatile devices, had to have the valves, were very big. Axial flow devices were much smaller and have the screw that is pushing the blood through the uh, housing and therefore pushing the blood into the aorta. So this was the uh, first, uh, the second generation of devices. I was very fortunate to be part of the development of this device and development of this device. This device is today still a working horse in the last 17 years. And there have been only 35 to 40,000 implants with this device in the world so far. So the Jarvik was uh, the very first uh, axial flow device next to the Beike. Luckily, or um, by coincidence, this was all developed in Houston. The Bakey was next door at Methodist Hospital, and these two devices were developed at Texas Heart Institute at our institution. Uh, so what is the, uh, the Bakey, just to show you a couple of slides about the pump. Uh, it was much smaller, and it has the fixed speed integrated into the, the compu into computer, and then this, you can adjust it by hand, but not by the uh, activity. And uh, it is uh, a pump that was very much the same way configured and uh, implanted as the other. The surgery was very cumbersome. The first device generation that we implanted, the surgeries were eight to 10 hours. We shortened the surgical time over here to uh, about uh, three to five hours. Uh, and nowadays we can do this in about uh, two to three hours. Uh, so much has changed over the years. This is the uh, implantation. I've done a lot of uh, uh, research with this device and then 
I was pretty much at all the uh, uh, clinical application at Texas Heart Institute with Dr. Frazier. So this was the uh, just different types, how we can implant. But the important things with the devices was once the patients went home, they really stayed at home. They didn't have to come back very often to the hospital and they had much better quality of life. That was a very important uh, message with these patients. Mr. Houghton here was done in London, in uh, England in uh, 1986 or 87, and he lived almost 10 years with this device without any exchange, without anything. He was that kind of patient that I showed you earlier. After this device was implanted, he climbed some mountains. He was uh, simpler mountains. He was traveling a lot. He was flying with the airplane and so forth. So quality of life, uh, uncomparable to his uh, mortality risk that he had if he didn't have this uh, implanted. So HeartMed 2 was really a working horse, as I said, similar, same axial flow, much smaller. You see that is one quarter of a, of a kilo that the whole weight was compared to the other device that was three to four kilos. And uh, you can imagine carrying three to four kilos plus console that, care, that is about two kilos. That's not easy for the patient. Nevertheless, this is the uh, placement. We were all involved in uh, many studies, not to uh, uh, pound on that, but this is important. When you see the rematch, so the trial that I showed you earlier showed the 50, uh, 25 to 50 percent survival. This was the old study, and the new study showed that these pumps had almost 70 percent survival. So in a few years, we improved for 25 percent survival. Now you tell me the drug that does that in the patient. Very few, if any. So uh, this is the uh, very much improved uh, quality of life. Patients went and, uh, you know, do the uh, 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 in a ballroom or ball bowling. And, and uh, uh, I would just like to show this patient. This was one of my first patients, really. A 14-year-old, uh, I started to do devices by myself uh, because there is a very complex training in early 2000s. This was done in 2004. A uh, 14-year-old uh, uh, little kid that came to us uh, dying, practically. I mean, you know, he was like, his uh, pressure was about 60. He was ventilating about 45 a minute, and uh, he was dying. I mean, he couldn't even speak. He was immediately intubated and went straight to the operative room. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, these devices not only prolong life, but also they help to improve the heart function to where you can take this device out and the patients can have normal quality of life on some medical, medical support. Two years and a half after this patient had the device implanted, we took it off. He's still alive today. He finished his college. And he's a great citizen and, and very model uh, speaker for us because he's so uh, fortunate and lucky that he had opportunity with this technology to improve his life. The third generation devices, now we saw that there was a screw. This has a blade and it's like centrifugal. So they spin with the centrifuge, and this is the, the one of those devices, DuraHeart, uh, very good device. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, as I said, the external components, if they're in the hospital, they have to have this big console, but the big console means it's like a, a smaller bag, you know, of uh, maybe uh, 30 by 30 centimeters. And uh, when they go home, they have uh, smaller consoles they can carry on their uh, belt. This is the inside of that kind of device. You see how clean it is. Obviously, biocompatibility is very important. This is after the transplantation taken out. And you see here how the, the uh, cannula uh, looks into the left ventricle where the blood goes into. Uh, again, this is after transplantation. So we, we always analyze all these devices and look for thrombus and so forth. Uh, as I said, the hardware is another of that kind of devices. This was just approved uh, about two weeks ago as a destination therapy. That means not only bridge to transplantation, but also you can put it in a patient if they cannot be a transplant candidate. Somebody who had cancer, for example, a year ago or two years ago has a heart failure because of the chemotherapy, and then you can put this device for the end of their life. And uh, this is just the position in how, how these devices can be placed either to the, to the tip of the heart, like I showed before, or to the bottom of the heart. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, studies that were done. But look at the survival here. I was talking about the 68% now. Now we are talking about one-year survival over here. 
you see over here we are about 90% uh, of the treated. So we are improving every decade, every five to 10 years, the survivors are getting better and better, technology is getting better. We're really just starting. This is not where we are flying jets today. We are really still at the era of the Brothers Wright and the beginning of the planes or cars in 1900s. So that's where we are, but nevertheless, uh, uh, we can and are helping a lot of pe people, you know, but the problem is not the survival, the problem is some complications that happen with these devices, so I would be unfair to talk only about the success, I have to talk also about what complications uh, can happen, and the complications, your perioperative bleeding like any other surgery, but here you are putting a lot of metal into the person, so obviously it can bleed at a lot of places, so we have to be very careful and cautious to put these devices in, uh, but we learned that if we can avoid going a heart-lung machine, the heart-lung machine triggers a lot of responses and inflammatory mediators that uh, cause also promotes the platelet activation and uh, bleeding is uh, clotting is not normal and so forth. And so if we can do this without heart-lung machine, we can have even better results, at least at the short term. We don't know if this helps really long term either. But uh, we are trying and we are still doing a lot of studies uh, infection is still the problem because obviously, as I showed you, there is a cable coming through the skin and anything that penetrates the skin can get infected. So we have between 10 and 20% uh, infection rate. We're trying to eliminate that and one way to eliminate, this is one of the CAT scans and you see over here, they shouldn't be there, you know, there is a lot of pus around that device, that's a major problem. And the only way that you can eliminate that is really transplant this patient, get all that stuff out and uh, keep the patient on antibiotics and then they can survive, otherwise they can die. Importance to prevent the infection is also how nourished they are, you know, that they are in good condition and so forth. But uh, the one thing that will most likely eliminate the infection is if we get to the point where the energy will be transferred across the skin with coils and not with the cable. And uh, we had used that technology already but it's not perfect. We used it in 2000s when we were doing abiocore total artificial heart. The longest patient that survived at that time with that technology was 17 months. But the technology worked okay. The reason and problem is that the companies are so happy to sell their products right now that they don't want to invest to something different until they milk the product. That they, so it's a business that they companies are not always they're looking for selling the product, but they're not looking always what can be the best for the patient because they get the, or want to get the profit. So you have to balance that. And unfortunately, that's how it is. Uh, so another complication that can happen is uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. The problem here is that we don't know, we have no clue why. We know that there is gastrointestinal bleeding between 25 and 30 percent, so one out of four, one out of three, they will get this bleeding when you put the axial flow pump into the patient and there is no valves, the post pressure will narrow. So that means between systolic and diastolic, there will be very short and small distance. That promotes the bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract. We have no idea why. We're doing a lot of research from Willenbrand factor. We're looking why the IVM malformations happen. We're looking why the patients bleed. And we can treat that according to what we find but we are not treating really the cause because we don't know the cause yet. So for young uh, researchers over here, great something that you can put your head in and dive into this research and tell us what is, what is going on. So a challenge for you. The AV malformation, we looked at this, as I said, and studied it, you know, and just uh, got this, but this is how uh, uh, arteriovenous uh, AV, so arteriovenous malformation looks in the stomach and the patient can bleed from that. Obviously, these patients are also anticoagulated, so they are on Coumadin or Warfarin, what is called over here in Europe, and they are bleeding because they have these malformations, but also because they are on blood thinners. But as soon as you transplant this kind of patient, all the bleeding ceases. They, they're gone, it's gone. So we don't understand it. We can put technology in, but there's a lot of physiology that we still don't understand and we are at the very beginning of this era. So although we've been dealing with this for 30 years, you know, but 30 years in the big scheme is, is really a very short period of time. So pump thrombosis is another one you see over here. It's a little poor picture, but you see the thrombus inside. If you 
flip to one side, you can have the bleeding. If you flip the coagulation on the other side, not enough, you can have thrombosis. So you're walking very fine line with the patients. You have to monitor this, just like the artificial valves that the patients have, or the, the venous thrombosis that they are on blood thinners or anticoagulation. Obviously, the reasons for this thrombosis can be just some kinking, uh, which is a dislodgement for the cannula. This patient fell, and you see over here how it should be, but it's uh, pointing the other direction because it fell right on the cannula, flipped it, the pump got clotted off, and then we had to replace it. The only treatment for this is replacing so another surgery. About 10% of the patients will get a replacement of the pump. Or some components get disconnected. Unfortunately, uh, this was happening in early days. Nowadays, they, the companies had corrected this, but you know, it initially, you have to, uh, wrinkles are there and you have to just uh, iron them out. This is one of those disconnected, and you see here how the patient bled. We saved this patient, but because of the erosion of this metal into the graft, the patient bled, and so we saved it with the transplantation. And this is the same thing, uh, so I wouldn't spend too much time. So, uh, or non-pump, so that was non-pump related. This is a pump related thrombosis. So what does that mean? Because the, there is also the bearing where the uh, rotor is spinning that is generated, generating heat. So the heat is also not good for the blood cells and for the blood and it can get the nidus of the thrombus, and then if the patient is not properly anticoagulated, the pump can clot. So that's heat generated. This is one of those kind of, uh, we obviously studied this. Uh, we studied with the computational flow dynamics. Uh, why does pump not get damaged? Because it spins through the, blood, through the uh, component, through the pump very quickly. If the pump would sit there, it's just like the, the machine for uh, meat grinder, you know, would be, obviously damaging the, the, the red blood cells. And then we look at the platelet, how they go, what happens to them. I'm proud to say that we are also collaborating in uh, our institution with the University of Mechanical Engineering Ljubljana. I'm a co-mentor for a, uh, a, um, a PhD thesis of this gentleman, uh, Dr. Primus Drescher, and uh, he's studying also the, where potentially the blood can thrombose inside the pump and they have a very good um, uh, computer, so a very fast high-speed computer in the Mechanical Engineering University of Ljubljana. That's what they are able to do that, and they found that there is a stasis behind the rotor over here, behind the blades, and so uh, they communicated that with the company also, and the company is making some changes. So very contributory uh, analysis uh, of this uh, uh, shear stress and the thrombosis potential and so forth. This is what they found, basically what I just said, you know, that there is a, some detachment behind the diffuse blades and the bearing is also located behind those blades and that could be potentially the uh, sources of infection. We look uh, of uh, thrombosis. We also look at the clinical studies, not only the computational flow dynamics, which is the bench uh, research, but the clinical studies. Uh, we were involved in quite a few of those, uh, why the pump gets thrombosed or why the patients have stroke. So this was one of the uh, uh, studies that we look over here, uh, endurance trial, and you see over here that the stroke rate in this particular pump was very high, 28% for that period of time. So compared to the c control group, about 12%. So what we looked was change the pressure monitoring, you know, because the pressure can also cause the bleed in the head if this is too high. We changed the INR, which is the uh, how, uh, much coagulation the patients can have and strictly more strict monitoring of that and so uh, change the dose of the aspirin from 81 to 325 also and that actually brought the stroke rates down to the level of the control group so that was very uh, helpful prevent was another one that we looked how to prevent the thrombosis in the pump we were uh, enrolled in one of the centers uh, up to these 300 patients uh, this was the algorithm how to tightly monitor the anticoagulation and what to do if this happens or that happens. Uh, and then um, we were proud to say that we were the number one enroller in the United States with uh, our uh, 34 patients. 
uh, and uh, the primary endpoint was reached. And you see over here that the pump thrombosis in the particular device was uh, increased during the after 2011. And then this trial decreased it back to where it was. is not eliminated, but we got certainly much better than we were a few years ago. So uh, this was in conclusion what we do for pump thrombosis. Avoid if we can, this kinkings and so forth. Patient selection is very important. If somebody has a trend toward thrombosis and the hypercoagulation, then obviously they have a higher risk for thrombosis. So you can select that before surgery uh, and say, well, maybe we cannot put this pump in. Uh, better pump designs, obviously, and so forth. New Elvet trials nowadays. The uh, great pump on the horizon is this one. We have some experience with this. The bridge to transplant here was approved, which is the six months monitoring of the follow-up, but the destination therapy is not yet approved. It's a very similar device. It has the centrifugal uh, blade, and it uh, has, uh, was designed for minimize the shear stress, minimize stasis, things that I was talking about, minimize flow patterns and uh, interactions between the blood and the contacted surfaces. How do you do that? with bigger uh, uh, or more space between the blades and the housing. And uh, here we have the uh, one millimeter housing, uh, one millimeter space versus the other pump that has a uh, about 100 times less space. And here is the comparison. In this space in the uh, heart matrix, you can put 167 red blood cells if we put them right next to each other. And in the other pump in the control groups, there is only about eight, so much more space to the blood to go through, much less chance of damaging. Uh, also, they have a pulsatile algorithm in their console and computer. What that means is that it washes every minute for a few seconds the blood in the rotor. So that is also preventing stasis and thrombosis. And the future uh, with MVAD and AVAD, these are smaller devices, obviously, not all that is smaller is better, but in this case, this may be better. We don't know yet. So these devices are coming to uh, surface and to new trials in America and in Europe. And um, obviously, this was a movie. Unfortunately, it's not working. But uh, our goal is in the future to put these devices not through the big, huge incisions, but to the very small incisions and through the arteries into the heart and that the devices will work as good as these devices. They are bigger today. And so we are involved, I just put over here to, to show you that our center is very involved in many research uh, trials. And, uh, you know, as we come with new ideas, obviously the uh, interest is to be involved in more trials. And uh, that was pretty much it. Thank you very much for listening. Ali si kljub svemu ne želite, da tistega pacijenta, ki ga pripeljajo, ne bi bilo pred vami? Ne, ravno ne robe. Jaz si želim, da je čim več pacijentov, ki jim lahko, ne da je čim več pacijentov, da čim več pacijentov lahko pomagamo in da ta tehnologija se čim prej razvije v smeri, kjer že danes vemo, kaj bi moralo se zgoditi, da se rezultati zboljšajo, kot na primer sem rekel, you want, should I speak in Sloveni or English? English. So the, uh, the imp improved uh, technology certainly would help, you know, like uh, eliminating, we know that eliminating the driveline would uh, eliminate the uh, infection. Infection, 20% infection causes 80% of those people, four out of five will die because of infection. So it's a very high mortality. So if we could eliminate that, that would be one of the reasons. And there is many other reasons that we could improve today that we know would uh, uh, improve the life. So, I, of course, the, uh, I am at the end of the therapies, right? So we have to prevent and try to modify what we can in life not to get to that point. So meaning prevention, good, li good uh, quality of life, uh, uh, a lot of exercise, good uh, diet, uh, eliminate the risk factors and live a modern uh, lifestyle with a uh, uh, reasonable or low stress would be ideal but uh, you know uh, that's utopia nowadays especially in the 
uh, involving uh, a world and, and moving forward in this tempo that we are all moving. So. Pravno, to sem ciljal, ne, namreč nič nismo rekli o tem, kaj povzroča pešanje srca in kakšni so načini, da to priprečimo. Ne vem, če vam je znano, pred kratkim smo pa šli do pomembnega odkritja skupaj sodelovci iz Trsta in Ljubljane, da v endotelijskih vaskularnih celicah lahko moduliramo endogeni bili rubin kot antioksidant. Ali mislite, da je mogoče kakšna povezava med povečevanjem protioksidativne sposobnosti celic in zmanjševanjem verjetnosti za pešanje srca. I am absolutely in agreement with what you just said, of course, in the longer future, so probably I won't see this, but you know, I'm talking about the therapy that is like bridge to something that will happen 50 or 100 years from now. I'm sure in 2117 they're going to be laughing at what we're doing today, no question. But, uh, you know, uh, does antioxidation help? Yeah, absolutely. Does uh, that kind of research help in the future? Absolutely. Do stem cells help in the future? Yes. Genetic therapy? Yes. Uh, gene therapy and uh, genetic alterations? Yes. Uh, cell growth on the skeletonized uh, 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 scaffolding? Sure. All that is what we need, and we need the young youngsters to, to drive that force. I mean, if I start to work on, uh, uh, you know, genetic alterations today or stem cells today, uh, that takes a lifelong research. I probably won't even move one foot further, but uh, definitely that is the therapy of the future. No question in my mind that this therapy that I showed you today will be forgotten in 2100. Pusti vaše kakšno strokovno vprašanje publiki. Za zaključek najnega pogovora samo še mogoče informacija. Poleg tega, da ste izjemni srčni kirurg, vas v svetu in tudi v Sloveniji poznamo tudi potem, da omogočate veliko študentom tudi iz Slovenije izpopolnjevanje, izobraževanje na vaši inštituciji. Je gre tukaj predvsem, ali pa mogoče za favoriziranje naših slovenskih študentov, ali je to vse splošno? Well, that's a great question. The start of that was 20 years ago, you know, and obviously I started with Slovene students. But Texas Heart, there were not only Slovene students. I just started with the Slovene students because I was from here and I connected to the University in Ljubljana Medical School. But we had students from all over the world, you know, the, a lot of students came from Holland and uh, Germany and uh, South America and Mexico. And so the idea was to at least give them the uh, opportunity to see a different uh, system. In one month that they come rotation or two months, there's not much you can learn. I mean, you learn in your medical school, but what you can see is uh, how the approach to the same disease, disease is no different anywhere in the world, is always the same. But the approach to the disease and the approach between the uh, faculty and between the multidisciplinary uh, uh, services is maybe a little bit different. And if they can see that and uh, grasp the benefit and take it uh, home, I think that's very much uh, uh, what they can get in, 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 in not only our institution, but in America, you know, if they come to the United States and everyone in the world for that matter. But on the other hand, you know, the question is the favoritism to Slovenes. Well, of course, I, I, I started with Slovenes, but I have students now from Croatia, from Bosnia, from Serbia, from Poland, from Czech, Czech Republic, from Mexico, from India, from South America. So, you know, we're just trying to open the door. Everybody that is interested, that goes to anybody that uh, is interested to come. I mean, all they need to do is just give me a call and, uh, and uh, we will facilitate for everybody because the goal is to share the knowledge and not to... And, and I, I know it sounds like a cliché, but it's really true. I mean, you have to share the knowledge and not hide it, and that's the bottom line. No, še damo možnost publiki. I'm sure Professor Gregorich will entertain also questions given in English, so don't hesitate. To kakšna vprašanja? Stanič. Ok. 
Baš tako je naslednje. Profesor Žeš. In the first part of your lecture when you discussed heart transplants, you mentioned that here in Slovenia we perform more of these, more of these transplants relatively, of course, than other countries. Is this good or bad? It's good. I mean, it's good because, well, let's be a little bit philosophical. So, you know, everyone that uh, donates has to die, right? But you, Slovenia is in neurotransplant. So you, your population of uh, the heart failure and end-stage heart failure in Slovenia is very similar than in Europe and the United States. The reason that that happens is because of the very active transplant team and very aggressive a a transplant team which in a way is good because you're helping more patients and if you can get the hearts from Eurotransplant, uh, on the other hand, Slovenia has a lot of donors, they're sent outside and they're sent to other countries in the world. You know, the traffic uh, accidents in Slovenia is very high, as you know. And so you have a lot of donors, they're also sent outside to the, to the Eurotransplant countries and therefore you can get a lot of hearts also. So I think the bottom line is that it's a very uh, active transplant team. And as you know, Professor Vertovic actually trained with us for two years. And uh, we collaborate for the last uh, uh, 17, 18 years, because he was there in 2001. And uh, uh, he and the team has done a tremendous uh, job in Slovene transplant and put it on a European and actually uh, with the stem cells on the world level. So I think that would be the answer to your question. Uh, I think it's good for Slovene population. In a, in a way, it's bad for people that die, but if they are available, uh, thank God we have them to help other people. Dr. Stanić. I was enjoying this lecture and uh, how, how uh, all this science is mixing with engineering. At least 50% of uh, this was uh, the devices. And uh, the characteristic that we are following, and then also the gadgets at the end. But now, uh, Slovenia, uh, I hope that we still have, uh, in average, uh, quite quality in, uh, of the health system. And, uh, but there is a, a, a small area that very important is children's heart surgery. How to overcome this problem? Because uh, where is the problem, basically? I'm sorry, what kind of heart surgery? Heart, uh, ch uh, heart surgery in children in Slovenia. Oh, children. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you're getting to uh, put me really on the spot here, right? <laughs> All right, uh, I have to be a little bit diplomatic uh, and very realistic, right? So, uh, look, the bottom line, uh, a very simple problem with the Slovene pediatric heart surgery is that there is no pediatric heart surgeon that is experienced 24-7 in Slovenia. That's the very ba basic problem. You know it started in 2004 when the, uh, Dr. Kosin, who was the pediatric heart surgeon, uh, had a complication and uh, retired. And then there was a surgeon over here that had a, a three years uh, career over here and then moved forward. Since then, there was a problem. Uh, I've been dealing with that for a long time, uh, personally, as you know, probably. And I am even currently an advisor to Ministry of Health how to solve this problem. Now, I have experience because I had grown up with the Texas Children's Hospital, which is actually the number one Texas, I mean, children's hospital in the world, number one. And I had observed and participated because our transplantation was connected with Texas Children uh, uh, for, for a medical review board and transplant and mechanical circulatory support. So I observed Texas Children growing from me media or, or, or good to extremely excellent, to number one in the world. So how did that happen? And I know the chief very well, he's my friend. Uh, Dr. Charles Frazier, and I asked him many times, uh, Chuck, how did you achieve this? And he said, well, you have to have support, you have to have the uh, spec, you know, the strategy, the people, the execution of the plan, and the cash. 
And so that is what is lacking in Slovenia, probably, you know, because uh, what, and, and in the world, if you look European and also the American pediatric heart surgery programs are not scattered to different centers, but they are one entity, they, everybody belongs to it, everybody has the goal to improve that to excellence and not just mediocrity, and they all strive for one and only cause, and that is to take care of the children, they need help. And I think that is really missing in Slovenia for the last 10 years. The focus, the focus to build this service that will serve this population of patients for the Slovene and maybe even the surrounding area. But what you need to do for that is to have the strategy to build the service, which is the center where everybody would be employed there, pediatric heart surgeons, pediatric cardiologists, pediatric intensive care, perfusionists, and uh, other uh, services that are directly involved in that, and then strive to train and teach the staff to be not good, not very good, but be only excellent. And when you achieve that, you will achieve the results that we are all, as Slovenes, looking for. And that is the plan, and that is the reason. But for some reason, that doesn't work, you know, because one is theory, one is practice. And as you all know, uh, the theory and practice, sometimes they don't see each other very well. Professor Bratina, Uh, when we run, our heart pumps blood uh, faster. How do you do this with a mechanical pump? Do you, you have a feedback loop probably, but Excellent what do you question. monitor? Excellent question. We're working on it. We're not even close there. There is no adjustment to the exercise yet. There are some tests, uh, a total artificial heart that has the configuration of the axial flow actually adjusts on the computerized algorithm, it has the sensation or sensory input of 26,000 feeds per second, and then adjusts to the higher need. Uh, one way that we worked on is uh, looking at the pressure in the left atrium, which is a collecting chamber, and on the basis of that pressure, because when you're working hard or running or whatever, then your left atrial pressure, because of more volume, gets a little higher. And so would that maybe be the algorithm to change the speed, which is RPMs, revolutions per minute, of the pump? So we're working on it, but we are not there yet. Dr. Clements, Zade, tako da dobio še. Nice to see you. Yeah, uh, at the beginning, when you show us those first uh, devices, uh, HeartMate 1, they, uh, they have been pulsatile as our blood flow. And uh, those HeartMate 3, HeartMate 2, Jarek uh, model, uh, do they didn't produce uh, this pulsatile flow. Maybe this uh, difference can be connected with uh, alternations in uh, our vessels, in uh, our arterioles, and uh, maybe the bleeding uh, is uh, connected with this, not only because we know that uh, if you have a very um, high frequency spin, you can destroy those large, uh, long uh, uh, chains of virulent factor, but uh, maybe, maybe also this uh, linear flow, you have no, no pass, uh, may produce uh, malformations or uh, may remodulate the vessel wall. But uh, as you mentioned, now research is uh, put over those uh, devices without the best with, um, with rotating yeah, magnetic field. And you're absolutely right. The, um, and, and great comment and great question. The um, two points, one is the pulsatility, one is the von Willenberg factor. Von Willenberg factor was more related to the damage through the pump and with recent devices with the uh, distance between the blade and the housing, it seems like heart mate three has much less potential for bleeding and the thrombosis and the cleavage 
of the von Willenbrand factor. We are looking into that, but we don't know the, the results yet. As far as the pulsatility, you're absolutely right also. There are, in Europe, for example, Jarvik had that algorithm put into the one-minute algorithm that for six seconds, actually, the, the revolutions per minute drop down to the base, so that is 6,000 RPMs, and then they go after six uh, seconds back to the, to the routine maintenance uh, RPMs. So why is that? Because that has proven, as we discussed, that the pulsatility, if the, we are made, the body is not made for non-pulsatile flow. The body is made for pulsatile flow. However, there are people who lived without pulse at all, because we closed, as you know very well, on many patients, the aortic valve, and so the whole blood supply to the aorta and to the body is through the pump, which is non-pulsatile. So the, there is potential for living with that non-pulsatility, but we don't know the long-term consequences of that. And uh, the, on the short term, we know that that causes the bleeding. So that is another thing that I was saying that we know today what the company should do to improve the results already. But for the company, and I will just give you this example, I was telling the company to change the only the graft, which is the cloth, the, the Dacron, from pre non pre clotted to pre clotted for 25 years. And it took them 25 years to change this graft because when they change this minuscule thing on the device that is approved, they have to go back to the trial, which is $300 million for a trial to go through to come and be approved again. That's why I said the companies don't want to do that. And it's extremely difficult to push the company to change the design until they can milk the uh, uh, research and development money that they spent and get it back and get uh, forward. What happened now, it's fortunate or unfortunate, but what happened is that the smaller companies were bought by the bigger companies. So hardware was bought by Medtronic and hardware too was bought by the Abbott. And these are giants. They have enormous amount of money for research. So we are very much hoping that they will put some money into the research and at least eliminate these things that we know would help the patients today. So that's where we are. Gotovo je še veliko vprašanj. Priložno zanje boste imeli v predverju Dvorca Lantieri, kamor vas vabim na druženje s profesor Gregoričem. Takoj potem, ko se mu zahvalimo še z enim aplauzom za izjemnje. Hvala. Hvala.